Hello and welcome everyone again. I'm sure some of you might feel a bit lazy after lunch, but stay with us to gain the maximum benefit out of this conference. Coming up, we have the session called From Functional to Differentiable Programming in Python with JAX. Let me introduce you for the session. Mr. Yasiro Ratnaika will be joining us for this. Mr. Ratnaika is VP for Product Development at Trabea, Building Data Intensive Intelligence System. His work involves building. He has previously developed solutions for biological supply chain and online retail. Having worked in non-life actuarial and having a master's in financial mathematics, he is passionate about machine learning applications in these domains. He also follows effective altruism and work in AI safety prototypes, composing applied research models, and leading agile teams taking their production, all the while closely aligning with diverse domains and product considerations. Hello, Mr. Atnaika. Welcome, and the platform is all yours. Hi, Hashini. Thank you. And then thanks to the organizers for having me. Um, and then welcome everybody to this session. Um, I, I hope it's not going to be too heavy for a session after lunch, but uh, we'll, we'll dive into some uh, really interesting uh, different paradigms uh, for programming that might not be what you're used to with Python. So let me start off by sharing my screen. Excellent. I, I hope you can uh, see my screen. So today we'll be talking about um, differentiable programming. Uh, what is differentiable programming? Um, we'll find that out, but the idea is pretty much the idea of differentiation that you know from calculus from school. And the idea is, um, you know, this idea of differentiation can apply not just to uh, mathematical functions, but also to functions more generally functions you might write in Python. Um, and we'll, we'll look at a very interesting library called JAX um, towards the end of the talk, but it's gonna be fairly brief um, with regards to JAX. But I hope that it will uh, inspire you to look further into that ecosystem, uh, as well as into differentiable programming more generally. Uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm Yasir Naik, as Hashni was um, introducing me. Uh, I work with a company called Trebea, and we're um, very much focused on building uh, data intensive applications, um, including data platforms, and then using that data for uh, machine learning based insights. Um, so without further ado, let's go into uh, the talk. So when you think about uh, machine learning, uh, you've probably had interactions with it, whether it's through um, your license plate uh, being automatically recognized as you park uh, at a mall, um, or whether it's through worries about facial recognition, uh, whether it's through um, online retail or, or one of the online experiences where you have uh, recommender engines suggesting things that might be of interest to you. Um, in this way, we've all seen a little bit of machine learning um, encroaching into our lives, really. And in some ways, it's, um, you know, much like anything else, it's made life better. It's made life um, a little bit uh, more worrying. Um, but on the whole, the advances have been really significant. And I wanted to start here because um, what we're seeing, uh, what we're increasingly seeing is that um, this encroachment of machine learning into different domains of our lives is now finally coming into uh, the modality of uh, programming. So, you know, we, uh, being Python programmers, we work with code, uh, we work with Python code specifically, um, and you wouldn't necessarily think that this is a lot like a um, online recommender uh, where the transactions are you buying something and then you get suggested things that you might be interested in. But increasingly, um, through programs like the one you see on the right, which is an offering from uh, GitHub called GitHub Copilot, which um, is actually based on a 
a machine learning model called uh, GPD-3 and, and specifically uh, focused on uh, code and programs. So you can see in this example, if you squint, um, that somebody started writing a uh, parser for expenses. Uh, they've given an explanation of what that function does in the doc string. Um, and then Copilot is actually able to tell, tell you what a reasonable function might be. So you've basically declared what you want. And this um, AI system has um, been able to generate something reasonable. And I hope it's um, reasonable. If you, if you were to use something like this, you'll see that it's actually fairly reasonable a lot of the time, but sometimes it does make mistakes. So you still have the human touch where you need to be able to um, evaluate what a program has suggested and really work in tandem with um, this AI programmer um, to, to build software faster and more efficiently. Um, in some ways, this is really uh, bootstrapping the problem that plagues AI today, which is that um, it's seen as a very esoteric skill set a lot of people, especially outside big tech, uh, find it very difficult to implement uh, AI in practice. And part of that is because of uh, the talent shortage. But really, um, you know, as I um, come to this kind of conference, there is quite a few people um, who are already developers who are working with Python and other languages. And really, um, the opportunity now is that you can turn AI on itself and um, kind of bootstrap your way out of this problem. Put um, machine learning, but more importantly, the techniques that underlie machine learning in the hands of um, your everyday programmer and democratize this technology and bring about applications that perhaps the more esoteric um, academic settings could never even uh, dream of. And that's really what this um, talk is gonna be about. Um, if I were to move on, um, what is differentiable programming? So we're going to look at what we're going to think about why it might be interesting and what's available in Python. So on the left, you can see uh, a Facebook post from um, Turing Award winner and um, lead of uh, Facebook's uh, or rather now Meta's um, AI lab um, speaking about um, differentiable programming. So he's talking about this um, in the light of deep learning, which you've probably heard about. This is the idea of using uh, neural networks that are deep in a particular way um, in order to bring about some of the advances like I was um, talking about, whether it's in computer vision, whether it's in language, uh, whether it's in recommenders, uh, et cetera. Um, so what um, Jan Lekun is saying here is that uh, people are starting to build uh, new kinds of software. And what they're doing is they're taking functions and these functions take in arguments. Um, and these are your parameters and they um, output values. Um, and then these functions can actually be trained to look at data. Um, they can be trained to compose with each other and they can be trained end to end in this way such that um, they can um, improve themselves really by looking at data and be very, very much data driven. And this would work whether it's function application, whether it's conditionals, uh, control flow, uh, loops and the like. So these are very dynamic programs. They're arbitrary programs. Um, and, and really what um, the workhorse behind this kind of uh, ability is, is something called automatic differentiation. So differentiation is, uh, as I was saying, uh, what you know from school. The idea is that you're after a rate of change. You're after a rate of change of a thing with respect to something else. So if you uh, jiggle the first thing, how much does the second thing jiggle? Um, and now you're trying to do this with programs. If you have um, a change in parameters, how does the program vary? That is really um, your question, the rate of change of um, programs with respect to their parameters. So um, the killer app of um, automatic differentiation has historically been um, for, for deep learning. But um, what I'm gonna try to convince you is that um, um, you know this can actually apply to more generic settings. Though our focus in this talk will actually be on um, 
deep learning itself. So what kind of other applications can you actually um, achieve through the more general purpose AD beyond, um, you know, beyond just deep learning? So this um, has been used in settings like probabilistic programming. Probabilistic programming is where you are um, dealing with um, probability distributions in your programs. And you can think of the probability distribution everyone knows is probably the bell curve. Um, so instead of um, working with uh, necessarily, um, you know, floats or ints, um, you, you have other types that might be um, distributions like the normal. So probabilistic programming is an interesting area where um, automatic differentiation can be brought to bear. Similarly, you can think of building scientific simulations. So a lot of um, the time in science, um, they deal with um, differential equations. So these differential equations are literally describing um, how rates of change relate to each other. Um, and what you can do is you can differentiate all the way through this kind of um, this kind of equational model, um, and you can optimize parameters for whatever pro uh, problem um, as expressed as solved through whatever program you've written, um, and, and you can kind of derive the uh, parameters end to end what they should be in the optimal case. Um, similarly, you have uses in computer graphics, especially an area called inverse graphics, where you um, create a bit of a generative model, which is some um, model that is able to um, generate what you're after uh, with, with um, certain assumptions. And um, automatic differentiation is also very relevant there. Um, when it comes to Python, you have several options. There has been a library called Autograd, and now it's been folded into what we're going to talk about today called JAX. And our focus will be really on um, JAX today. Uh, but you've probably heard of things like PyTorch, Chainer. Uh, you've probably used um, a type of uh, automatic differentiation uh, in, in frameworks like TensorFlow and Keras as well, if you've ever dabbled in those. Um, but before we get there, I do want to um, bring your attention to something called functional programming. So we're already tackling um, a paradigm, which is differentiable programming. But functional programming is another paradigm, and I like to really think of it as a sister paradigm um, that I believe has uh, a lot to bear uh, on, on differentiable programming and can really um, help our thinking, especially when we are starting out, when we're trying to figure out what this is. Um, functional programming makes things simple. It's purely about the application of functions. So you... Um, have values uh, that the function takes as arguments, and then the function outputs other values. And those might end up being uh, arguments for other functions. And functions are really first-class citizens in functional programming languages. What that means is that um, functions can take in other functions as uh, their arguments. Functions can output other functions as uh, their values. And also you can assign functions to variables you can, um, you can store functions and data structures and the like. So what I've given here um, in terms of these boxes you see on the bottom right is a set of features that I think would um, set functional programming languages apart. Um, most uh, functional programming languages uh, exhibit at least a few of these features, uh, but we're going to focus uh, particularly on the ones in um, the reddish purple here. Um, you can see, um, you know, with respect to Python, that some of this is not really Python's bread and butter. You have um, recursion, for example, but um, Python doesn't really implement tail call optimization. So whatever you do with recursion, which is, you know, calling a function within itself, as, as, as it, within its definition, um, and kind of um, collapsing down to a base case, um, what you're going to end up in Python doing is uh, building up your stack, and um, this can cause uh, your, 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 your stack to overflow. So uh, we're, we're not going to be looking at particular aspects of this, but we will be looking at function composition. So this is uh, functions that might um, compose with other functions. They, they take in the 
values created by other functions, but they might also be higher order functions where um, they're really looking at uh, taking in as arguments other functions, and they might even um, output functions as their result. We're going to be looking at pure functions. Pure functions are functions that all they do in terms of output is uh, produce values. They do not have side effects, um, which means that you don't, uh, you know, you can't really do um, input output in a, in a natural way. Uh, you, you might have to find a bit of a workaround for this, but we're not going to really dwell um, on some of these. Uh, another one that we'll briefly touch on is lazy evaluation. The idea with lazy evaluation is that um, you only compute when you absolutely have to. And you, you might have some um, knowledge of this, uh, this kind of, uh, or you might have encountered this kind of thing if you're at all familiar with Python's iterators and uh, generators, where um, until you force the um, iterator uh, with the next method, it hasn't you know, started computing. So you have to keep on um, going through the uh, next method in order to force that evaluation. But we won't really touch on these except to, um, except to uh, briefly comment. I do invite you as we go along um, to identify opportunities where um, you know, this kind of thinking can be brought to bear or where I am actually using uh, functional uh, aspects and I'll make some note of it also. So as I mentioned before, the killer app for um, automatic differentiation is really still uh, deep neural networks. So we're gonna start by looking at the architecture of a um, simple multilinear perceptron. So um, it, it's, it's a bit of a mouthful, but really this is uh, a, a very, um, very much microcosm of what deep learning is. Uh, because you have you can understand what deep means um, and you'll understand what learning means and we're going to look at it this from a supervised learning setting where you're going to have um, a program is what we want to ultimately come up with and the architecture that we um, that we assume is going to place some constraints on the structure of that program um, and what we're going to do is we're going to give it a array as input your x's and you're going to give it. Um, you're going to expect an array of outputs. Your y's. So these are called vectors, and, and you'll be familiar with them if you're familiar with um, NumPy in the form of arrays. And you might be thinking, okay, you talked about different data modalities. You talked about images, text, and the like. How do vectors really help? Well, the answer is that uh, a lot of these successes have come about by um, embedding. Uh, in, in certain vector spaces, some of these different data modalities. So if you have an image, you can think of each pixel um, and, and line those pixels up together into a vector. You can think of a piece of text. It could even be a bit of code like uh, with GitHub's Copilot. Uh, and you can imagine this uh, bit of code being turned into through some lookup of a vocabulary into a certain vector. And this vector might be the kind of thing that is fed to this kind of network or something more complicated. So if you've got these in input output pairs, um, what we want to do is we want to create this um, estimate for y. We want to create this f hat as I've, as I've written here. And this is really the composition of some functions. What is composition? Well, it's um, the application of these functions um, um, on, on top of each other um, as exhibited by the second equation over here. Um, so you're, you apply your first function, um, f1, on your input, but then you take the result of that and you've applied f2. You take the result of that, you apply f3, and so on up till some n number of, um, uh, of functions. And this is really where um, the idea of deep comes in. So each of these functions is what you would call a deep layer, uh, in, in a, a layer rather, in a deep neural network. And what I'm going to argue is that each of these um, functions in a, a deep neural network are actually compositions themselves. They are composing a uh, linear piece with a nonlinear piece. So your linear piece is the GI, and you can um, see what uh, 
that looks like. So you're, you're taking some vector uh, and you're producing another vector. So uh, the idea is that the vector that you take, it gets multiplied by this um, matrix W of weights, and then you add some biases. So the idea of this affine function is that uh, because you're taking it, you're, you're not just multiplying it, you're just, you're adding also a bias. So this weight into the uh, input plus the bias, this constitutes a the linear part of your layer. Uh, but now you want this to be nonlinear, which is where, um, you know, the real power of uh, deep networks come in. So here you just have a function that, um, that introduces some sort of nonlinear behavior. So if I said this was linear, then you could think of, um, you know, nonlinear, you could say, you know, maybe you square it, maybe you do something else, uh, but we'll see a concrete example later. Um, what do you actually get um, when you do all of this? This might be uh, more intuitive. You have your uh, data point going in, there is a function f, but that function is really composed by g and sigma. So this g also takes in these weights and biases. And then the output of this function goes into another function block like this, another layer f, f2 perhaps. And then it goes to f3 and so forth until you end up in fn. So fn also has that same structure. And ultimately, this uh, should be outputting your estimate for, um, uh, for, for your y, which is this f hat. But um, how on earth are you supposed to find what these uh, weights and biases are? So this is um, where the trick comes in. So the idea is that not only do you output uh, the estimate for your y, you're going to take that estimate and you're going to create this uh, loss function. So you do have some examples of x and y because you have um, these pairs, x and y, right? So you think of it as, uh, you know, during training time and not your production time. So during training time, you uh, what you do is you create this uh, loss function L um, and this is a norm. So what you do is uh, you take the um, difference uh, of each of the parameters uh, between if y is an array, so element-wise, you can look at y being an array, f hat being an array, element-wise, you take the difference, you square them, and then you sum them up and, and, and find the mean. Um, so what we're trying to do here, as you can see, is um, if, if this, um, if this uh, f hat is a perfect um, estimate of y, then you'll see that um, you'll see that this loss goes to zero. So you want, what you wanna do is you wanna optimize this program in such a way that you can minimize this L um, and you wanna find these Ws and Bs that minimize that L. So the way we're gonna do that is uh, we know how to do this for a mathematical function. If you remember from school, what you can do is you can take the gradient of this function um, and what you do is you would um, you would look at the uh, gradient and that'll give you the steepest incline uh, of the function. Uh, but then you'll move away from that direction. So you take the gradient, this funny symbol here is the gradient, but in a vector form. So this gradient is with respect to the parameters. We call the Ws and the Bs together theta. Um, and then you take that gradient of this loss function um, and then you move in the negative direction, um, and then you move by a certain uh, learning rate, this uh, eta here. So your new um, set of parameters will be the old set of parameters, but you're gonna move a little bit. So assuming that you have a way of computing this gradient piece here, you do have a way of um, making these Ws and Bs better, but how are we actually gonna compute this gradient? So, um, let's try to make this concrete. And I think you're, um, um, you're, 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 you're thinking finally we've got to some Python and, um, you can see that I've tried to make this concrete. I've got myself down to only one layer for simplicity's sake. And, um, I'm trying to be very concrete about these earlier. I didn't really say much about what the nonlinearity might be. So here's a idea of, um, a nonlinear function. So this is np.maximum you give it um, your x and you give it zero. So 
um, in, in, the, um, in, in the scalar case, what you're going to get is if x is uh, negative, this function is going to give you zero. But if x is um, positive, it's going to uh, give you that um, a rather non-negative. It's going to give you x back. So this is a kind of piecewise continuous, um, piecewise linear function, really. Uh, and this is just one example of what that uh, kind of function might be that suits uh, sigma here. Um, in terms of your affine piece, the linear piece, um, you've got your params, you've got your uh, input, and what you're going to do is you're going to unpack the params into weights and biases. This is your theta would be the params, and then you're returning this uh, matrix multiple. So you're you're really looking at uh, the weights into the uh, input plus the bias, just like you saw in the maths before. So the, one of the nice things about Python is that you can very easily translate between equations and this kind of, uh, uh, this, this kind of simple function. Um, what about the loss? Well, the loss is um, your parameters it takes in, all, all these Ws and Bs. Um, it takes in your inputs and it takes in the outputs uh, that you know. So these are the known XY pairs that you have an association for. So it could be that, uh, you know, these are the X's are somehow encoded uh, pictures of, uh, you know, your, uh, your your car's license plate and the Y is the uh, license plate number uh, in, in some way encoded. So based on the picture, you're trying to figure out what was that number. Um, so what are you going to do? You're going to create that estimate from this. So you're going to apply your um, linearity on the params and x, just like just this function. And you're going to apply ReLU on top of it to get this f. So this is really your f hat here. Um, and now you're going to return the loss, which is, as I said, the mean of the squared uh, differences. And if you have all this, then what you can do is you can define this gradient step function. So. The idea of the gradient step is that it takes uh, parameters and it explores the gradient space. Uh, sorry, it explores the parameter space by uh, moving along the gradient through that gradient descent rule. So it's fairly concrete here. So as long as you have your loss uh, and your parameters, you can and if you can compute the gradient of the loss with respect to the parameters, and if you have a learning rate, then what you can do is at the each step you can have the new parameter be the old parameter minus this learning rate into that gradient. And then if you keep improving in this way, the idea is that um, you'll eventually find the right W and B such that this loss is minimized. So how can we do this? Uh, we can just you know loop over the number of steps with an appropriate learning rate. So here you're, you know, I'm just assuming that this grad function exists we still don't know how that could be implemented. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply that grad function on the loss. You can see that this is a function that takes in a function. Um, and then presumably it outputs a function because what it does next is it takes the same uh, arguments as loss did, which is the parameters x and y. Um, and once you have these grads, you, what you can do is you can compute this big list of um, the gradient steps. So you're going to um, take the parameters, the gradient, uh, the learning rate, and you're going to look at these pairs of parameters and gradients to, to produce this. Um, but there's something not so nice about this, because you can see that everything up to this for loop, we've actually used these pure functions. Um, they take in values. They output values. They don't have side effects. They're pretty small and, and nifty. Um, and we've seen a little example of the composition of these here. But um, now you've got this ugly for loop and you've got this um, kind of list comprehension going on here. Um, do you really have to move away from, uh, from, the, you know, from pure functions? Well, I would argue that you don't have to. And um, I have not implemented it here in the interest of time. But um, here are some hints if you were to, uh, you know, try working that out for yourself. So you can see that the gradient step is exploring the parameter space. Uh, 
So ideally, you would give this a um, set of parameters. It'll output the next set of parameters. But it also takes in this gradient and the learning rate. But you know these are fairly fixed, uh, presumably. So is there a way to actually um, make this uh, function of three arguments into a function of one argument where you can fix some of these? Um, there is actually a package called functools, which offers a function called partial, which can help you achieve that. Um, you've also got this kind of um, function application in this uh, list uh, comprehension over here, this last line. Um, what can you do about that? Can that be uh, done in a way that doesn't involve this kind of loop? Well, I would actually argue that list comprehensions are in fact a uh, higher order function, which are functions that take in other functions. Because if you think about it, this is kind of sugar, syntactic sugar for uh, something that operates on your gradient step and operates on this list. Um, but there, there is again a function called map that comes with Python's uh, base library. Um, there is also something called either tool star map, which you might want to use uh, when you're mapping over um, uh, over some iterator. Um, here you, you can see that what map can do, if it's something like this, it's basically going to take a function, it's going to take a list, and it's going to apply the function on each uh, element of that list and, and return that to you. Um, and finally, uh, we're doing all this computation at once where we're stepping through um, you know, through this, uh, through all of these steps that you want to run your function through. But, um, you know, maybe there is benefit to doing this in a lazy way. Maybe you only want to do it up until you need the computation. So what you can do is uh, you can um, use iterators and you can use something like uh, func tools reduce or either tools accumulate to um, keep chaining these things um, together. And there is a talk that I will um, point out, which uh, goes into a bit more detail on this, uh, quite a bit more detail. Um, but for now, these will be kind of our musing of uh, perhaps a better way, or at least a different way. Now, the big question that we had is around differentiation. How are we going to do this? So you can see this um, cartoon. You, you know, this might be what you did at school. You started, you tried applying these different rules that you knew. Is it done? No, I go back and try applying a few more. Um, and finally, you know, it, it's hopefully done. Um, but maybe we can do a little better. We know something called numerical differentiation. So what does numerical differentiation do? Um, numerical differentiation um, looks at the limit definition of a derivative. So here's what that is. So on the left, you've got this derivative. And what you're saying is you have this quantity, which is um, the function, um, and, and you want the function at a point A, the derivative of that. So what you do is you take the function, you apply it to A plus H, and then you subtract uh, the function applied to A, and then you divide it by this H. But the idea is that you make this H smaller and smaller, and you can implement this pretty straightforwardly, as you can see here, and try for small values of H. Um, but there's a problem with this because um, you're going to end up using floating point arithmetic and you can see this division here. And, and you know, if you're ever going to compose some of these together uh, through multiplication, say these errors are going to be compounding and you're going to see a lot of um, numerical instability. You're also going to see some complexity concerns that we won't go into here. So what's the other way of doing this? Well, um, you know, pretty much. Um, exactly like in the comic, what we can do is symbolic differentiation. So if you're familiar with a package like SymPy, this is what it does. It, um, well, this is not quite what it does, but this is perhaps a first stab at implementing something like this. This is taken from the book, uh, The Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs, uh, which is a really great book um, if you want to start diving into um, functional programming. Um, but this uh, example has been translated from Scheme to Python. So you've got this function called deriv, um, and it takes an expression, and it takes uh, the, um, the variable. So what it's going to do is it's going to do pretty much what the comic is saying. Is it a, is it a number? Uh, is the expression just a number? If so, uh, for, for a you know, constant, the derivative is 0. Um, is it a variable? Well. If it's uh, just the variable, 
itself, then it's uh, one, otherwise it's zero. Is it a sum? Well, you know, maybe you have a certain class defining what a sum looks like. So you can do this kind of function called make sum. And then you're applying this uh, derivative again, and you're, you're applying it to uh, the, the, two, the two parts of your, your sum, your uh, addend and augend. Um, and then you're deriving them in turn recursively. And you can do something similar uh, for the product. Um, and this is really through uh, the standard rules that you know uh, for uh, derivatives, the power, the, the product rule, just the sum rule and, and the like. Uh, there are some missing, but um, you know we could do something like this. But um, you've got to ask yourself, is it really the expression that we care about? Because this is going to end up giving you an expression. Um, but is it really the expression that we care about or do we just care about the value of, um, you know, the expression that we're trying to derive? And can you even fit all of your program into a single expression? So these are good questions. And this is why these two might not be the best way to go about this. Um, and what we're going to do is think about an approach called automatic differentiation. How does this work? Um, I, I mentioned before that you know this is the workhorse of differentiable programming. And in particular, for the deep learning architecture we looked at, we had this lingering question. How do we take um, the gradient of the loss efficiently? Well, something we can do is we can recall the same limit definition that was on the previous slide. And by just rearranging it, you have this kind of approximation for small values of h. So this is saying that um, some uh, the function at some uh, point a plus a little bit of h um, is actually the function at that point a plus the derivative of the function at the point a into this h. And this only works for small functions. And if you really think about this a little bit, and if you, um, you know, recall some of your, um, you know, high school and high school maths, you might have seen Newton's method, you might have encountered first order Taylor polynomials. This is really what it's doing. You're assuming that beyond h squared, those terms are so small that they don't matter, so that this is a good enough approximation. So with this as um, something of a uh, inspiration for us, we're going to consider numbers of this form. We're going to consider numbers that are a plus b e, where a and b are reals. Um, and there's this, uh, sorry, b epsilon rather. And this epsilon is a quantity greater than zero, but it's still such that um, epsilon squared equals zero. So you're not going to find this kind of number in the reals, but let's assume we have that. And let's try implementing this. So here is a class that implements this idea of what's called a dual number. So this dual number has a real part and it has this dual part. And if you print it out, it's, it's going to say it's a, a dual number. It's got a real part. It's got a dual part. Um, you can take a float and then you can cast it into a dual number. You can add um, two together. So if you've got two dual numbers, they're going to add the real parts. They're going to add the dual parts. You can multiply them. So I'll let you actually um, figure out if this um, uh, if this logic is right for both the multiplication and the uh, taking an exponent, uh, because it's really to do with this. And you just have to uh, try adding, try multiplying, and try taking powers. But always remember to apply this um, epsilon squared being zero to simplify this. But supposing we have this, what I'm going to argue is that you can get automatic differentiation very trivially, and it's just this. So you've got this function forward um, ad, and that takes a function. It takes a uh, number, uh, and it's just going to return the function on the dual number, and then it's going to take the dual part. Why does this work? Well, it's because um, if you think of h as this epsilon, then the derivative at the point that we're interested in is just the um, just the uh, multiplier of your epsilon. So what you do is you, you feed in uh, one as your epsilon, and um, sorry, uh, uh, yeah, one as your uh, epsilon here, and, and you get this. So you have, you know, this, this actually works. This is something of a working implementation, though not all the details are given here. Um, you're, you have this function, which is x plus x squared. And if you work that out in your head, 
x the derivative um, and we're going to try to figure out what the derivative is at the point two so x if you derive that symbolically you're going to know that it's one so one plus and then for x squared it's two x so one plus two x and then you evaluate it at two it's five but you can you know try this for yourself now this is really cute but we have actually uh, by choosing to do things this way we've uh, avoided the real complexity with implementing the automatic differentiation sorry um which is um you know using the chain rule and looking at um the two different modes that uh, you can implement uh 80 width are so here you've basically got what's called forward mode um automatic differentiation but a lot of the specifics are really hidden from you through this nice uh, dual number idea. Uh, but the idea is that, you know, this thing scales in terms of time complexity with the number of inputs and the number of nodes uh, in your neural network, perhaps. Um, but this might not be really ideal, um, you know, if you have so many inputs, right? Um, and, and there you might, uh, and, and you're just trying to get one thing out. So you might instead like to do reverse mode automatic differentiation, which is actually what uh, AD systems like JAX implement. So in the reverse mode, your um, program, your complexity of getting the derivative, it scales with um, the number of outputs. So if you've just got, um, you know, you're feeding a picture of a cat, you've got many inputs there because it's every pixel, but you're just trying to say, is it a cat or not in this picture? So that's just one, Thing that you're trying to output. So in that case, this reverse mode um, AD will be um, what will be better. So um, the implementation done here is done through something called operator overloading, but this is not the only way of um, implementing this. Let's actually, um, you know, now that you have an idea of what it is, let's very quickly look at JAX to conclude with. So JAX is a library that implements something like this. Uh, although more general, and the grad that you can import from JAX is actually the reverse mode rather than the forward mode that we implemented. Um, and what JAX is going to do, it's going to be able to, you know, be that grad function that we wanted to make this whole scheme work. So, um, so what you're going to do is you can actually, uh, JAX, um, wraps the NumPy interface. So you might think, you know, if you were going to do this uh, with something like our dual number, you might also do something like this, where you offer the same um, interface uh, as ints or floats. But here, uh, Jax is doing it more generally with NumPy. It has this grad function. So if you have a loss function, you can apply grad to it. Go up, you got the gradient with respect to its first parameter, uh, first argument, rather. That might be the params, right? Um, and you plug this in and everything that we talked about would really work. Um, there's other pieces of JAX that I don't think we have the time to go into right now. Um, but I'd like to conclude by pointing you to a uh, higher level API for building neural networks built on top of JAX called Stacks. And the nice thing about this is it's a purely functional uh, framework. So you can, um, you know, compare what we try to do with what Stacks actually does. And you can see how the functional ideas can actually be um, implemented in real life through, um, through using JAX, even though it is, a, uh, it is a language like Python where you know, it's more general purpose and, and functional isn't the only way to do things. You can still um, you know, see how such a thing is implemented. Um, so that brings me to the end of this talk. Um, I've left some resources for you, uh, both in terms of uh, functional programming in Python, functional programming more generally, and also on AD and how to implement AD. Um, and that's pretty much what I have for you today. Thank you. I will take some questions if we do have some time. Yes, we can reserve some time for the Q&A round. Uh, yeah, so you can clear your doubts and now you can raise your questions through the Q&A tab. Let me read out the first question. 
Should currently, I I'm doing. Oh no! Please, please go ahead, Hashmi. Thank you. Currently, I'm doing functional programming using Haskell. So, is it way more different from doing it using Python, or is it kind of the same? What language is used more in the industry? Um, no, I think Haskell is a really um, interesting, you know, great choice uh, for for learning functional programming because you can learn it in a very pure kind of way. Um, in Python, I really wanted to demonstrate this because some of those ideas are apparent in JAX. Um, some of what we didn't get into is using some of the program transformations uh, in JAX. So CRAD is something that you can um, you know, use on your loss function, but then you've also got ways to maybe compile that uh, using a just-in-time compilation with JIT, and then that's going to just wrap around your CRAD. Um, or, or others like VMAP that we didn't really get into. Um, but the idea is really that, uh, you know, Haskell's great, but it doesn't really have quite the ecosystem that you want for uh, numerical computing, um, whereas Python does. Um, can you do some of the same things in Python? Uh, yes, but there are some caveats. So one, one thing that I didn't really talk about is how Python doesn't um, optimize for some things. I did briefly touch on it with regards to uh, tail call optimization. But um, in a similar way, you might want to be careful. And I especially wouldn't recommend really putting too much of what I, the, the kind of thing that I uh, showed the homespun kind of ideas into production. Although JAX is being used, um, including in production in, in a lot of places. I hope that answers the question. Moving on to the next question. I would very much like to know design philosophy of JA. Yeah, so um, in terms of the design philosophy, we, we touched on this briefly. So our um, you know implementation was um, with uh, you know before we got to JAX, it was um, around the duals, right? So the dual numbers, you can think of this uh, more broadly as uh, what's called operator overloading. So you're trying to get um, you know more out of um, the, the evaluation than you know, is, is uh, encoded in the language by default. So JAX takes this kind of operator overloading approach. Um, and I think that might be a good place for you to start. You can actually go to the JAX docs and it has a bit of a under the hood view that, that you can um, get into a bit more detail, but I think I'll leave it at that for now. All right. So since we are running out of time, I think it's time to wind up the Q&A session and the session two. So thank you, Mr. Ratnaika, for conducting an interesting session. And we invite all the delegates to move forward with us for the next session in Python in Data Track. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Mr. Ratnaika. Good afternoon.